Groudon, the continent Pokemon versus Kyogre, the sea basin Pokemon. Welcome everyone, I'm exceptional and I hope you are too. Today, the box art legendaries from Generation 3 will be competing in a head-to-head -head race to clear Pokemon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite Four. These two primordial legends have been known to butt heads in the past, but today there won't be any interference from Rayquaza. They truly are two sides of the same coin, both with a base stat total of 670. Kyogre has incredible special stats while Groudon is more physically focused. We have a ton to cover in these runs, so as always let's choose who goes first by rolling a die. Let's say 1 to 10 for Groudon, 11 to 20 for Kyogre. Natural 20, let's go! I choose you, Kyogre! Coming into these runs, I expect that both are going to be less about finding quirky strategies and more about pushing the absolute limit of how quickly we can get through the game. Kyogre definitely has an advantage in its ability Drizzle. Drizzle creates the rain weather effect at the start of battle, boosting our water type moves by one and a half times. Add in stab or same type attack bonus for another one and a half times multiplier, and our base 60 power water pulses already have an effective power of 135 using also our outstanding 150 base special attack. Including a type advantage against Brock, we find ourselves with a very quick early game. I only defeat the mandatory bug catcher at the end of Viridian Forest. Because of our slow growth rate though, I do defeat Camper Liam in Brock's gym. He's a super easy 402 experience. Brock, of course, stands no chance. Our four times super effective water pulses hit both his Pokemon for a staggering 540 base power with water pulse. Oh yeah, buckle up everyone, we're diving into the realms of unhinged power today. We continue through Route 3 and Mount Moon, defeating only the mandatory trainers. We, of course, grab the Helix Fossil because Omanyte is blue and so is Kyogre. Dabba dee dabba die, dabba dee dabba die. Oh, sorry, the 90s kid in me got a little lost there for a second. Misty is the water type leader, so I decided to try out Rival 2 when we first get to Cerulean. Despite being three levels lower than Pidgeotto, we almost one shot it with a neutral water pulse. Who's having fun? I am. When Bulbasaur comes out, though, we get a little bit of a reality check. He puts us to sleep turn one, and Kyogre enjoys their nap while Bulbasaur slowly takes us out with Vine Whip. Huh, alright, well let's go try out Misty instead. Against her Staryu, despite it being resisted, our Water Pulse is doing around half. It is faster than us though, getting in a Water Pulse for not a lot of damage while we take it down. Starmie is a much, much more powerful Pokémon, however, and although we're doing well against a fully evolved Pokémon that outlevels us by a factor of one and a half, she manages to take us down. Alrighty then, Cerulean City has proven to be a great reality check. Apparently we are not invincible. I defeat both trainers in Misty's gym before trying her again. Now at level 15 we've learned Ancient Power, so I decided to try using that against Staryu, hoping for the 10% chance for an Omni Boost. We get it turn 2, increasing our attack, defense, special attack, special defense, and speed by one stage. Now that we're nicely boosted with the power of the Ancient, Starmie stands no chance, taking it down while we're still in green health. Sweet. Now that we're powered up a little bit, let's try Rival 2 again. Alright, I have to admit it, this is super lucky. I get the Omni Boost again, turn 1 against Pidgeotto. This is also a great demonstration of Istitia's power with special moves. Two levels lower, a neutral Water Pulse was hitting for more damage than the super effective Ancient Power this time. Bulbasaur Sleep Powder is actually still a really big threat for us. Even with the Omni Boost, I could have easily lost this battle if the sleep effect had lasted longer. Does Kyogre have sleep apnea or something? I mean, if you sleep for millennia and then wake up tired, you should probably get that checked out. We get an absurd amount of misses against Abra, but after Bulbasaur went down, this battle was a foregone conclusion. Abra and Rattata both fall. I continue along helping Bill and make my way to Vermilion City. I'm still collecting my usual items like the citrus berry and rare candies during this initial playthrough. I'm not sure if they're going to be needed, but in the Pokemon League for instance, I'd rather have them and not need them than need them and not have them. I'm also making sure to grab the trash can berries from the kitchen as we will not be wasting time catching extra Meowths today. 
Against Rival 3, we can really see our power rising. Now outleveling his team, we one-shot Pidgeotto. Once Ivysaur is out, he puts us to sleep again, but then his super effective Vine Whips are only doing 12 damage. We take him down and then clean up his Raticate and Kadabra. Easy. We have a type disadvantage against Lieutenant Surge, but, um, that doesn't matter. Istitia outspeeds and gets a one-hit knockout, or Oko, against his Voltorb, Pikachu, and Ace Raichu. This marks the start of what I can only call the mid-game mayhem. There are very few things to consider aside from go fast. Below Celadon City in the Rocket Hideout, we level up to 30, granting us access to Calm Mind, a setup move that increases both our special attack and special defense by one stage. I would say that I was excited and used it immediately, but nah. I mean, Kangaskhan has some decent bulk, but I'm genuinely not sure if that crit mattered. Before flying back to Lavender Town, I unlock Saffron City by giving the guards the tea and do some shopping. This is the earliest access we get to Max Repels, and I want them. We crush Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower, so instead I'll discuss my nickname. I wanted something primordial and water-based, so what better than the primordial deity of elemental water is Tishia from Ed Greenwood's Forgotten Realms. As you may have guessed from the D20 at the start of the run, I love me some D&D. I clear the tower and move on to Sylph. I haven't cleared a single additional trainer than what has been required of me. Kyogre is so strong. Against the Rocket Brother before the healing bed, we level up to 35 learning Ice Beam. In combination with Water Pulse and TM34 Shockwave from Lieutenant Surge, we have all the move diversity we'll ever need. And this isn't even our final form. While we're here, I'm, of course, going to face down Rival 5. Ice Beam gets a clean Oko against his lead Pidgeot. Against Venusaur, we do around three quarters while he puts us to sleep. Uh-oh. On the next turn, we snooze away while Venusaur hits a critical Razor Leaf, getting an Oko of his own. Ouch. Well, that's an easy fix. I set up a single Calm Mind while Pidgeot hits Wing Attack, doing more damage than I'd expected. Oh, right, I guess we're only level 35 right now. With that single turn of setup though, we now Oko Venusaur, Gyarados, almost Growlithe, but he knocks himself out with Recoil, and Alakazam. Things have been moving so quickly, and Kyogre is already so far into the game because I found myself absolutely lost in editing and scripting this. I'm having so much fun right now. I wonder how Groudon has been doing though. Groudon does have a few disadvantages compared to Kyogre, especially in Generation 3. First, the physical special split hasn't happened yet, so he can't take full advantage of his ability Drought, which increases Fire-type damage by a factor of 1.5. In Gen 3, all Fire moves are special, so it won't be using his formidable 150 base attack. Second, the weather effect Groudon produces doesn't have the added benefit of having the 1.5 times Stab modifier. To top things off, even our starting move, Mudshot, has 5 less power and 5 less accuracy than Kyogre's Water Pulse. With all of that being said though, Groudon is still a force to be reckoned with. Our early game mirrors Kyogre's, defeating only the mandatory Bug Catcher and Camper Liam in Brock's Gym. Camper Liam takes a little longer as his Sand Shrew has great defense and we are 4 levels lower right now. Kyogre obviously one-shot this guy, but he's not going to slow us down that much. Against Brock, we can rely on our chunky physical stats, as well as having a super effective ground move against him. Two mud shots take out his Geodude, and two more take down Onyx. Because of our level ups during this battle, Grumbar actually ends up at a higher health by the end. We continue through Mount Moon the same as Kyogre, but I do defeat an extra trainer or two along the way. The advantage of going second is that I know that we can't just steamroll Cerulean once we get there. I of course take the Helix Fossil. We have to keep this as even a playing field as possible. With Grumbar, I am 100% targeting Rival 2 first, as we have a type disadvantage in the gym. Having taught TM39 Rock Tomb from Brock, we have such an easy time against the rival. Yes, we learn Ancient Power at level 15, in my opinion a much better rock move, but having Rock Tomb earlier gave us much more power point flexibility through Mount Moon. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I do have to take a mid-Route 25 Poke Center trip because we ran out of PP. I'm already thinking of optimizations, and perhaps it might be a good idea to duck down the second ladder in Mount Moon to grab the Aether. I'm thinking that's less time than running back to the Cerulean Poke Center. We were one trainer short of making it all the way to Bill and the hidden Aether outside of his house. 
Before leaving Cerulean, I do want to attempt Misty despite our type disadvantage. Drought does have the advantage of having the damage of water type moves against us, so it's kinda like not having a type disadvantage. Ancient Power almost gets the Oko against Staryu. Okay, next time I'll use Mudshot here. I was aiming for the Omni Boost though, getting it on the last turn before Starmie enters the fray. Even with the Omni Boost and Sunlight on our side, Starmie is getting some big hits in, but we hit harder. Starmie falls and I don't think Grumbar has many more challenges for a long while. On the SSN, I make sure to dip in and grab TM31 Brick Break for our growing arsenal of physical moves. I also make sure to grab the Trash Can Berries as we will not be running with an army of Meowths today. That's a time loss that we don't need. Rival 3 is our next progression gate. With our diverse, powerful, physical moveset, Grumbar carves a path through his team with ease. The reason I chose the nickname Grumbar mirrors Istitia for Kyogre, also known as a Tujin, Grom, and the Earth Lord. He is the elemental embodiment of Earth. Another title is the Gnarly One, and chia, this dude's power is gnarly, bro. Lieutenant Surge is next on the list, and I mean, do I even need to comment on this battle? We are the legendary continent Pokemon, and as a ground type, we have a major type advantage. Fun fact, of all of the moves on his team, the one that can do the most damage to us is Voltorb's Sonic Boom. I think we've got this one. We find ourselves in the mid-game without skipping a beat. I clear out the Rocket Hideout and come to Erika's gym next. I clear the trainers on the left side, focusing on attack EVs. At level 30, we learn Bulk Up, the physical equivalent of Calm Mind. I set up once and begin my attack against Victory Bell while it uses Stun Spore, activating our held Cherry Berry after a mildly concerning Giga Drain. At only plus one though, we take it down because of its lower physical stats, we Oko Vile Plume, and then her green Spaghetti Monster. I unlock Saffron, buy Max Repels, and come immediately to Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower. I take a second to jumble around my moves because I didn't like the order that they were in. In hindsight, I could have set up one bulk up to avoid a couple of turns here, but once again, it's barely a blip on the map for this primordial Pokemon of perplexing power. It's in Pokemon Tower that I have my first major mistake with Groudon. I was trying to think so far ahead of myself that I forgot to exist in the now. We have a moveset of Return, Brick Break, Mud Shot, and Bulk Up. See the problem? We can't hit Levitating Ghosts, which are all of the Ghastlies and Haunters in here. It's okay though, remember, the first playthroughs are all about taking chances, making mistakes, and getting messy! Now we find ourselves in Sylphco, continuing the rocket plotline. Just like Kyogre, I'm not doing any additional training or item collection as we work our way through, aside from grabbing the rare candy from 10F and the hidden protein on 3F. Little did I know how valuable yet avoidable collecting these rare candies will be. I received a comment on the last video that including myself saving before battles was a little distracting so I'm trying not to include so much menuing this time. Just know that I am saving before most key battles. I am always open to feedback and making improvements for my audience. Shout out to Cory for bringing this up. At level 35 we learned Earthquake, our most powerful stab move. After setting up two bulk ups against his Pidgeot, we handily take out his entire team. Groudon is feeling very unstoppable at this point in the game. While Grumbar absolutely ruins Giovanni's day in the background, let's take a moment to see how our two competitors are doing to this point. Kyogre definitely led the first two badges, but by Lieutenant Surge, Groudon actually pulled ahead by 26 seconds. After defeating Rival 5, Kyogre's time is faster, but Groudon has already defeated Erika, whereas Kyogre has not. This race is actually quite tight so far, especially considering the learning curve involved. Grumbar's next logical step is to take on Sabrina in Saffron Gym. As a reasonably fast, incredibly gifted physical attacker, Sabrina's whole team stands no chance. I realize that I'm not giving every single one of these battles an in-depth explanation, but I mean, there's only so many times I can say Oko without it getting stale. After a quick stop in the Celadon department store, we've now spent nearly every piece of currency that we've obtained maxing out our speed and attack EVs. I continue down cycling road skipping as many trainers as I can and only collecting the hidden rare candy directly east of the third sign in the eastern lane and the max elixir three tiles east from the sign at the bottom of the slope section. After clearing the Safari Zone, I move to defeat Koga. We get hit with a nasty Toxic on turn 1 while we set up a single bulk up. Both Coughing and Weezing have the Levitate ability, saving them from our Earthquakes, but it doesn't save Muck, nor does it save any of them from Grumbar's outstanding power. 
just like that, we find ourselves facing our seventh gym leader, Blaine, on Cinnabar Island. You'd think that having the ability Drought would be bad for us here, as we don't resist fire damage and the weather is powering it up. After a single bulk up, Earthquake crushes his whole team with super effective damage. Note that we're still five levels lower than his Ace Arcanine. Our final gym badge also goes similarly. I still haven't cleared any additional trainers or made any deviations from progress, progress, progress. Brick Break misses the Oko against his lead, so I bulk up once and then sweep. Because of Scary Face lowering our speed, we do take some hits taking us to Red Bar, but we're fine. I guess that's what I get for starting a gym leader battle at half health. Rival 6 is our last challenger before the Pokemon League. We set up two bulk ups while Pidgeot uses some increasingly ineffective wing attacks, even with the turn 1 crit. With that setup though, Grumbar rolls through his entire team once again. Coming up in the League though, we have some scary battles in Lorelei, Lance, and definitely the Champion. I'm super interested to see how this goes. Grumbar hits the League doors at 53 minutes and 13 seconds. Let's not leave Kyogre behind and see how his Tishia is going to handle the rest of the pre-league challenge. Having just defeated Rival 5 and the Rocket plotline, we challenge Sabrina. Because Sabrina's team is definitely more focused in the special stats, Kyogre has a slightly harder time here. But, you know, that's relative to Groudon. This battle is a cakewalk, using an opportunity against Mr. Mime to get in a single Calm Mind before dispatching of her entire team. I then return to Celadon, making sure to swing down and defeat Erika before buying our vitamins. With Kyogre, I focus on the right-hand side of the gym for the special attack EVs, once more reinforcing the dichotomy between these two Pokémon. We do have a type disadvantage in this gym, but to that I only have two words. Ice. Beam. Heading south to Fuchsia City next is Tishia is about to get a massive power boost. At the end of the Safari Zone, we finally gain access to Surf. In my initial planning, I'd planned to dip down here earlier for it, but as it turns out, we don't need it. Surf replaces Water Pulse as our primary attacking move. Remember how Drizzle and Stab boosted Water Pulse had an effective power of 135? Surf now brings us to 202, not 203 because of the truncation of decimals in Fire Red. With that incredible boost to Kyogre's raw potential, we face down Koga. What can I say? With no setup, Surf Oko's his entire team. I'll take a moment to acknowledge my pronunciation. Groudon and Kyogre may not be the correct ways of pronouncing these Pokémon's names, but it's the way that I've been saying them for 20 years. Am I willing to adapt? Sure. But it's kinda like the Final Fantasy X main character, when I found out that his name is actually Titus. I accepted internally that I will forever be wrong in calling him Titus. It just sounds so much better. There should be no question about the absolute success of his Tishia against the last two gyms. Blaine being the Fire-type leader, we have a clear advantage. We don't need any setup at all to outspeed and wash away his entire team with rain-boosted surf. Coming into Giovanni's gym, we're looking at the exact same story. Up to this point, I have continued only battling mandatory trainers because we haven't had the first glimpse of needing any extra power than we already have. Giovanni has five Pokémon, and we have more than five Surfs. Enough said. Our last challenge before entering the Round 1 League is Rival 6. He always acts as a fantastic preview for what's going to come in the Champion Battle. Similarly to the Rival 5 battle in Sylph, however, in this attempt after a clean Oko against Pidgeot, Venusaur fires back an Oko of its own with a crit, stab, super effective Razor Leaf. We take another reset. Wouldn't you know it, I solve it the exact same way I did Rival 5. I set up a single Calm Mind against Pidgeot before taking it down with Ice Beam. Venusaur is back out, and at plus one, we barely don't get the Oko. Bad range, cleaning it up on the next turn. His remaining Rhyhorn, Gyarados, Growlithe, and finally Alakazam all fall in quick succession. But we do have one last stop before we start the league. I forgot to step into the Poké Center on Route 10, otherwise I could have flown here directly. Now that we have Surf, we can follow the water's edge south on the outside perimeter of the map. This leads us to the Power Plant. We're here for a TM that I have not picked up yet in any of my runs, so excuse me as I bumble around looking for it. There are some Pokéballs on the ground that are actually wild electrodes, so watch out! Finally, in the southeastern corner, we find what we're after. TM25 Thunder, which bypasses accuracy checks if used in the rain. Kyogre hits the league doors, ready to go, at 52 minutes and 14 seconds. Compared to Groudon, we are in the lead by just under one minute. There were some fluctuations in the mid-game, but they were because of our two competitors following separate routes. The Pokémon League, however, is where it all comes together.
Welcome to the round one Elite Four. I want to take a moment to appreciate my brain sometimes. What move did I just get and why? Thunder, because it won't miss in the rain. What do I do against Dugong? We start setting up while she changes the weather. I mean, with that said, we do work our way through her entire team with relative ease, but I could have done this smarter. Next run. Say hi to Bruno, everyone. Um, yep, say bye to Bruno, everyone. Agatha is definitely the most threatening member that we've encountered so far. Against her lead Gengar, we set up to plus one while it double teams. With the actual weather still in our favor, Thunder bypasses accuracy checks, taking out Gengar in one shot. We then Oko her Golbat and Arbok, bringing us to her ace Gengar. She puts us to sleep turn one, and between our nightmares and incoming sludge bomb is Tishia Falls. This will be another easy fix, I hope. I equip our Chesto Berry and perform the exact same strategy. Agatha is also going for the same strategy, but this time our Chesto Berry wakes us up. With Stab and in the rain, Surf is doing significantly more damage, getting the Oko. Haunter in the back is an easy cleanup. Lance isn't going to be a problem at all. Keep in mind that by the end of this battle, we're going to be 9 levels lower than his ace. Thunder obviously gets the Oko against Gyarados, then with Ice Beam we Oko both Dragonairs, his Ace Dragonite, and then Surf cleans up Aerodactyl. Against the champion, I assume that it's going to be roughly the same situation as the last three rival battles, so I set up two Calm Minds against Pidgeot before taking it out. At plus two, we Oko Venusaur with Ice Beam 11 levels lower. I switch to Surf to get the Oko against Alakazam, Rhydon, then Thunder for Gyarados, and back to Surf for Arcanine. Istitia has such incredible type coverage, I love it. For a first playthrough, this went incredibly smooth, which was to be expected. I was stunned when I looked at the timer and realized that we're about to clear the round one league in less than an hour. Istitia clocks in with a round one finish of 58 minutes and 37 seconds at only level 53 with six resets. This took three hours and 35 minutes of game time. It feels like for every advantage Kyogre had, Groudon has an equal number of disadvantages in Fire Red. Grumbar has a type disadvantage against Lorelei, both icy and watery. Drought at least will help reduce her water moves, unless Dugong sets up Hail on turn one while we bulk up. I switched to Brick Break, barely missing the Oko, so I predicted the heal and set up once more with bulk up before taking her down. Cloyster is darn near the exact same story, just missing the Oko, but the heal doesn't go off even though I use the turn to set up once more. After some protection anagans, it falls. At plus three now, we have no problems getting an Oko against her Slowbro, her Frail Jinx, and Ace Lapras. Okay, that wasn't too bad. Coming into Bruno, I can honestly say that my mind was not in this fight. I expected it to be incredibly easy, but that's the great thing about Fire Red. Almost every trainer can surprise you. I didn't bother setting up at all and have been smashing through his two rock snakes when Hitmonchan hits the field. I switch to Earthquake and get a rude awakening. We miss the Oko, bringing Hitmonchan into Red Bar while he fires back a counter, which doubles the physical damage received back to the attacker. Ouchie. Well played, Bruno. Well played. In the next battle, I set up two bulk ups, then take out his Onyx, second Onyx, Hitmonchan, Hitmonlee, and Machamp with ease. That's the Bruno fight I was expecting. Agatha is always a challenging fight for physical Pokémon in this generation because of the sheer lack of powerful moves that don't hit her. Our moveset was full of them, and our next best option I had in my bags was Fire Blast. Well, let's give it a shot. After a miss, we take out her lead Gengar. Oh goodness, I was so focused on the ghost types, I forgot about Golbat. Earthquake doesn't hit, I'm saving Fire Blast for the ghosts, and Brick Break is four times resisted. ruh -roh. I scramble to figure out something, but Golbat takes us down. I have no better options here, so I actually take the whiteout and leave the league. I head immediately for Rock Tunnel. It's tough to see in the footage because I don't use Flash, but in this area of the cave is a move tutor that will teach us Rock Slide. At 75 base power, but with only 90 accuracy, it seems like the best solution. We end up wiping once against Lorelei on the way back through because 90% accuracy sometimes means 10% in these games, but we've already seen those battles. Coming back to Agatha, with the Lorelei accuracy wipe fresh in my mind, I don't set up, instead taking out her lead Gengar with two rock slides. I then set up to plus two and Oko her Golbat, Haunter, Ace Gengar, and Arbok. I apologize to the Groudon fans, this was some poor play on my part. 
time for Dragon Master Lance. Against his lead Gyarados, I'm intimidated, literally and figuratively. In scripting this, I checked, and Gyarados does not know Hydro Pump. Figurative Intimidation nullified. I set up two bulk ups, bringing us back up to plus one attack after the Intimidate and take it out. We aren't getting Okos, but we do smash through his Aerodactyl, Ace Dragonite, and then the two Dragonairs in the back. Alright, time for the round one champion. I set up two bulk ups against his lead Pidgeot before taking it out with Rock Slide. With our setup, we outspeed an Oko Blastoise with Earthquake. But we have a problem. Executor is next and has the ability Chlorophyll, which doubles its speed in the sun. Because of this, it outspeeds hitting a Sleep Powder. With free reign over our snoozy Grumbar, it takes us out with two Giga Drains. I wiped three more times here before finally figuring this one out. I've used five rare candies, bringing us up to level 58 over two damage rounding thresholds. I set up one bulk up against Pidgeot, then take it out, missing once with a Rock Slide. Here's where my trick is. I set up one more bulk up against Blastoise, giving him a turn to change the weather, setting up his own rain. We then outspeed an Oko with Earthquake. Our Rock Slide still doesn't get the Oko against Executor, but thankfully we managed to get through it with a turn 2 wake up. This was lucky, but in editing this playthrough I now know what I'm going to do here next run. With that problem out of the way though, we then Oko Alakazam while it sets up Reflect, we shatter the wall with Brick Break, Okoing Rhydon, and clean up Arcanine with Earthquake. Whew! Oh man, Fire Red was just not designed to be fair for this matchup. With that being said though, I know that my play was lacking, and trust me, I'm pumped for the second playthrough. We still have a round 2 league to get through though. Grumbar clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 7 minutes, and 43 seconds at level 59 with 8 resets. This took 3 hours and 57 minutes of game time. I'll post the time standings at the end of the round 2 league. Given his Tishia clocked in under an hour though, I think it's obvious that for this first playthrough, it's going to Kyogre. But we still have some learning to do, so let's see how the round 2 league goes for both of these legends. Groudon has one extra chore to take care of while in the Sevi Islands. Once I have access to it, I take a quick trip over to Seven Island and scoot over to this move tutor that will teach us Swords Dance. I want it over Bulk Up, as Bulk Up increases our attack and defense by one stage each, while Swords Dance increases only our attack by two stages, having our setup time. Welcome to the Round 2 League. Among some team and moveset changes, every single League member's team has been increased by around 12 levels. I only need to set up once against Lorelei's Dugong, bringing us to plus 2 for the Oko with Brick Break. We can then Oko Cloyster, Piloswine, Jinx, and her Ace Lapras. Bruno goes the same as Lorelei, with us setting up a single sword stance against his lead Steelix. Earthquake takes it out, then a Brick Break handles Hitmonlee. I'm scared of counter, so I switch to the more powerful Earthquake for Hitmonchan getting the Oko, then Machamp leveling to 65 and not taking Solar Beam, and finally his second Steelix falls as well. Against Agatha, we again follow roughly the same strategy. I rock slide turn 1, doing over half, then set up a single sword stance and take it out. We Oko Arbok, who hit and intimidate, taking us back to only plus 1 attack, and then Crobat falls as well. Against Mistrevis, we miss the one shot, so I set up one more sword stance while she heals. With the 90% accuracy of Rock Slide, I felt that playing for two hits instead of one with an SD was more risky. We drop it and then finish off her Ace Gengar. Round 2 lands can definitely be scary, so I set up two Swords Dances, bringing us to plus 3 attack after the Intimidate. I then Oko Gyarados and cross my fingers. I misclick on Brick Break, taking Kingdra into a sliver and use the opportunity to set up one more SD. Why not? Earthquake finishes it off. His Ace Dragonite falls to a single Rock Slide, but that was our last one. I switch to Brick Break against the lower level Dragonite while it uses Flamethrower getting a burn. Aw oh boy, the burn is the worst case scenario here. Along with taking more damage each round, this also cuts our attack. We polish off Dragonite and face down his final Pokemon Aerodactyl. We survive its Earthquake, but our Brick Break just barely misses the Oko, leaving it with a sliver. The burn damage polishes us off. I use an elixir and the battle goes the same so that when his ace dragonite is falling we still have plenty of rock slides remaining. His second dragonite is now an oko and then so is aerodactyl. Gosh, that sure went better. 
The round two champion has an incredibly powerful and diverse team. Let's see how this goes. I set up all the way to plus six while Heracross does about a third of our max health to us before falling. Even at plus six, I still use the same tactic as last round, allowing Blastoise to change the weather for us before Okoing with Earthquake. Executor will not outspeed now and we take it out with a single rock slide. Alakazam hits a big psychic, taking us down to only 49 HP, but we take it out with Earthquake. Tyranitar activates a Sandstorm, which for once we don't get hit by as a ground type. We outspeed and Oko. This is the heartbreaking part. Because we got hit by a Rock Tomb from Heracross, our speed is minus one right now, allowing Arcanine to outspeed and hit an overheat, taking us down. You'd think that based on how smoothly that fight went, it would be an easy fix, right? Not today! Heracross can knock us out, and even getting to Arcanine at higher health can still knock us out. You know how I said earlier that the rare candies were so important but definitely avoidable? Well, now that I've used all of them, we're at level 73. After a total of six resets, we finally get somewhere in this battle. At this level, we only need two SDs to take out Heracross, again having minus one speed from Rock Tomb before taking it down. We get our final setup of SD, bringing us to plus six attack while Blastoise changes the weather and we get the Oko. We then Oko Executor, Alakazam, and Tyranitar, bringing us back to the Fire Doggo at nearly full health. This time he outspeeds and goes for Iron Tail. Really? You couldn't have done that five minutes ago, dude? Excuse me while I grumble for a second. Alright, I demonstrated why the rare candies were so important, but how could they possibly be unnecessary? Imagine, if you will, how this fight would have gone with the power of Substitute in our corner, avoiding the speed drop and not having to level into absurdity because of Arcanine. Grumbar clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 31 minutes, and 31 seconds at level 73 with 15 resets. This took 5 hours and 10 minutes of game time. Unlike Grumbar, Istitia has no extra chores to run while rocking the Sevi Island plotline. Let's see how it handles the round 2 league. I lead against Dugong, going immediately for Thunder because I don't want the weather changed getting the Oko. Lapras is out and we miss the Oko while using a Thunder of its own, getting the 30% chance to paralyze. I use the opportunity to set up a Calm Mind, but because of the paralysis cutting our speed, we take too much damage and end up fainting. It was in this moment that I remembered something. Round 2 Dugong's love of double team. I risk setting up a single Calm Mind against it this time, well it does just that. Thunder bypasses accuracy in the rain, so we get the Oko. That even included an Ice Beam misclick turn 1. At plus 1 now we Oko Lapras, and the Cloister with Thunder, then Piloswine, and Jinx with Surf. Against Bruno, I'm feeling incredibly confident. Even so, for safety, I set up a single Calm Mind while it misses a Rock Tomb. I can handle that. Surf then Oko's Steelix, Hitmonlee, Hitmonchan, Machamp, and his second Steelix with ease. I don't have any Chesto Berries left for Astitia, so I equip a Person Berry instead, just in case. With no setup at all, only our Stab and Rain Boosted Surf, we have enough power to Oko her entire team. We take a few hits along the way because at only level 60 and 61 during this fight, it's no surprise that we're getting outsped sometimes. I love calling Round 2 Lance the Dragon Doctoral because, well, if he used to be the Dragon Master, by the time we encounter him in Round 2, he must have progressed in his Dragon career. I do not want to be paralyzed with Thunder Wave, so I take out his lead Gyarados immediately with a 4 times super effective Thunder. Ice Beam Oko's his Ace Dragonite and Lesser Dragonite, bringing us to Kingdra. Ah, uh, a Pokémon that we don't hit for 4 times damage. It takes a few turns, but I don't feel very threatened at all before taking it down and cleaning up Aerodactyl with Surf. Champion time. I use an Elixir, heal up, and go for it. We miss the Oko with Surf against his lead Heracross, so while he heals, I set up a Calm Mind, getting the one-shot on the next turn. Unfortunately, because of the speed drop from Heracross's Rock Tomb, Tyranitar can now outspeed and take out his Tishia with Aerial Ace. I go right back into the fray without changing a single thing. This time I lead with Calm Mind while Heracross misses a Rock Tomb. Perfect. I think that's all we needed. I outspeed an Oko Tyranitar, bringing out his Ace Venusaur, who outlevels us by 12 levels. So awesome. Including the Sandstorm damage, we take it to a sliver while it sets up the sun. I predict the heal, setting up once more with Calm Mind, and Oko on the next turn with Ice Beam. 
I can then take out Alakazam in two, Gyarados hoping that we don't miss the thunder in the sunlight, and Arcanine in the back even with our surf damage reduced by the sunlight. Alright, I am so stoked to start playing the second playthroughs. Kyogre has some optimizations that we can do for sure, but Groudon is the one that I'm really looking forward to. With my pinky on the corner of my mouth, I'm ready to unveil my plans. <laughs> is Tishia clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 19 seconds at only level 64 with 9 resets. This took 4 hours and 42 minutes of game time. Because I'm so excited about it, let's review Groudon's second playthrough first. Comparing the initial playthroughs, we can see that because of how poorly Groudon performed in both leagues, we lost a ton of time, coming in just over 14 minutes shy of Kyogre at the end of round 2. But let's see how much time we can shave off for both runs. For starters, everything in the stats of both Pokémon remain the same. Groudon keeps an adamant nature focusing on attack while sacrificing special attack. I will also note that in all of my runs I give my Pokémon the maximum 31 in all IVs or individual values unless I'm using a specific hidden power type. For these two it's all about max stats and I don't want to invest the time in finding TM10 hidden power. Groudon's early game remains largely unchanged. I clear only the mandatory bug catcher, and unfortunately, because of some sand attack shenanigans against Camper Liam, I have to make an extra trip to the Poke Center to restore our PP before taking on Brock. The Brock fight, though, is just as easy as last time. After grabbing the Helix Fossil, I quickly stop at the Move Tutors just outside Mount Moon. We had a couple of PowerPoint issues with Groudon last run that I'd like to make better this time. I grab Mega Punch to give us a great normal type move with 85 base power. Because of its slightly lower accuracy, I will replace it with Slash at level 20, but having the extra PP right now is so valuable. I come into Cerulean City ready to rock Rival 2 at level 15. Ancient Power handles Pidgeotto easily, then with Mudshot handling Squirtle, we easily clean up his remaining team. After a bit more experience, Misty is also very easy. I use Ancient Power against Staryu, hoping for the Omni Boost, which we don't get. Omni Boost takes Starmie under half, lowering its speed so that on the next turn, we outspeed, taking it down. I then defeat Rival 3 and Lieutenant Surge, making my way back to Cerulean and onwards to Route 9. Here I make sure to grab TM40 Aerial Ace, which is going to replace our normal move option for the entire mid-game, giving us a great high PP option for Rocket Grunts and Ghosts. I defeat Giovanni in the Rocket Hideout, then head to Erika, who I have to show. Expecting a Stun Spore from Victory Bell, I have a Cherry Berry equipped. She instead goes for Poison Powder while I bulk up. Then, because of her ability Chlorophyll, she outspeeds in the sun, hitting a massive Giga Drain, taking us down to 29 health. After the poison damage ticks us down to 15 health, we face down Vileplume. Oh my goodness, the poison damage did 14 damage, and we have 15 health with two Pokémon to go. We outspeed an Oko with Aerial Ace, bringing out Tangela, and we barely cling on with 1 HP. I outspeed and Oko Tangela, but wowza, I have never seen Victory Bell use Poison Powder. That was a little grim. Next is Rival 4 in Pokémon Tower, then Sylphco continuing the Rocket plotline. I am once again not clearing extra trainers or collecting anything other than what I deem to be the bare minimum of items. Rival 5 can definitely present a threat, so before him is going to be only my 4th or 5th save to this point. I'm really trying to save time however I can. Pidgeot is a big old troll, using Feather Dance and eventually Whirlwind while I try to set up. I get frustrated only going to plus one before knocking it out with two Brick Breaks. At only plus one though, Blastoise is an Oko and his remaining team poses no threat to Groudon as we smash through. I then defeat Giovanni, finishing the Rockets, Sabrina, and buy every vitamin we can afford on the way to Fuchsia City. Here I make another change and talk to the Move Tutor in front of the Kangapen. He teaches us Substitute, a move that sacrifices a quarter of our max HP to create a decoy that will absorb damage equal to the health sacrificed, as well as status effects from opponents. This essentially nullifies the threat from moves like Sand Attack, Hypnosis, or abilities like Intimidate. 
I then defeat Koga, head to Cinnabar and defeat Blaine, and finish off Giovanni completing the gym challenge. Against Rival 6 we can observe Substitute in action. I set up 1 hoping to avoid sand attacks, but Pidgeot is going all offense with wing attack. I set up 1 bulk up before taking it down with 2 aerial aces. Plus 1 Earthquake gets the Oko against Blastoise, and between AA and EQ we clean up the rest of his team. I make a quick detour to Rock Tunnel, teaching Rock Slide before entering the league doors at 49 minutes and 20 seconds, about 4 minutes faster than last run. Outstanding. Before we dive into the league, let's investigate the changes that I made to Kyogre. It also remains unchanged early, sticking with a modest nature, increasing special attack and decreasing attack. I follow the same route as last time, approaching Brock and steamrolling him before we even hit 4 minutes. This time, I'm going to put a little extra effort into clearing additional trainers leading up to and throughout Mount Moon, still collecting the two rare candies available up to this point when entering Cerulean. Also, all praise Lord Helix. I defeat one more trainer in Misty's gym, then use both rare candies bringing us to level 19. This may be slightly too absolutely untested, so I cross my fingers and challenge Misty. The reason for the additional grinding is because we got so lucky against both Misty and Rival 2 last run with the Omni Boosts from Ancient Power. I try for it again here against Staryu but fail to get one. Starmie is out but because of our extra levels it can't hold a candle against Kyogre's clean, calculated, concise conquest. I'm hoping that the extra levels will also aid against Rival 2. I fire off a Water Pulse turn 1 against Pidgeotto, getting the Oko as I want him to know we mean business. I level up to 20, learning Body Slam, which I use immediately against Bulbasaur for what looks like around 4 fifths of his health. I also get the 30% chance of paralyzing and fully paralyze it. With luck like that, the rival stands no chance and we clear out his remaining team. Not much else is going to change for Kyogre. I defeat Rival 3 on the SSN, Lieutenant Surge, and make my way through Route 9, ensuring to enter the Poke Center on Route 10 so that we can fly back here later to collect TM25 Thunder from the power plant. In the mid-game, it's the same route as last time, clearing the rocket hideout. Oh, I guess the crit did matter last time. Barely. I then defeat Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower, bringing us to Sylphco and Rival 5. With the lessons learned last run, I know to set up a Calm Mind before taking down Pidgeot. With that setup, we Oko Venusaur, then the rest of his team. It's then Giovanni's turn again, then Sabrina, the department store for vitamins, and the Safari Zone for our massive power boost from Surf. You may know this by now, but Kyogre is astonishingly powerful. We've barely slowed down once. Next to fall is Koga, and then, um, wait, am I forgetting something? Oh yeah, Erika. I'd say that at our higher level this time, she's easier, but that would be dishonest. An Oko is an Oko. Because I'm backtracking now anyway, I also take the time to quickly run over to the power plant. This time I make a beeline to TM25 Thunder, because I can be taught, before digging out of a power plant. Perhaps that wasn't the wisest choice, but I'm sure that Meowth did his one call beforehand. Now on Cinnabar Island, we defeat Blaine, then complete the gym challenge, wiping out Giovanni one more time. Again, leaning on my present knowledge from last run, I get my setup in against Rival 6 and take him down. One final change that I made in both runs is only collecting rare candies that were directly in my path. Another time save in and of itself, but also saves time because I used a few rare candies before Victory Road. Both Pokémon were so underleveled last time that our max repels didn't repel all the wild encounters. This time they do. Kyogre enters the league at 48 minutes and 20 seconds, just under 3 minutes quicker than last run, and exactly 1 minute ahead of Groudon. Here we go! I use Thunder immediately against Dugong, taking it into Red Bar and missing the Oko while it sets up Hail. Don't! Oh well, I set up a Calm Mind and do what I did last time. Thunder takes it down. Against Cloyster, I predict the Protect, setting up once more with Calm Mind. It uses Spikes, so I predict the Protect again, setting up once more? Why not? Cloyster doesn't have much special defense, so at plus three I'm confident Surf will one-shot, and it sure does. We then Oko Slowbro, Jinx, and her Ace Lapras. Before Bruno, I used 4 rare candies because we leveled up to 49 perfectly after defeating Lorelei. Being at level 53 is not necessary for Bruno, but with the candies in our bag we might as well use them. Let's just say it's for consistency. And fun. Mostly fun. Bruno requires no setup and gets swept away. 
Are you ready for the flub of Kyogre's run? Everything seems to be going swimmingly against Agatha's first few Pokémon. I Oko her lead Gengar and Golbat and take a turn against Arbok to set up Calm Mind for safety for her ace. She hits the field and uses Hypnosis. Um, why am I still asleep? I forgot to equip my Chesto Berry. No, come on. Nope, we take a reset. Hey, that works a lot better when you have a berry equipped, eh? It's not like I encountered the exact same situation last run or anything. Such is life, though, and we take down her Ace Gengar and Haunter in the back. While Kyogre obliterates Lance, I have a great yolk for you all. What's the worst crime imaginable according to an egg? Poaching. <laughs> Seriously though, poaching is a real problem. Animals deserve our love and respect, as does every conscious being. Just love each other. It's way easier than spreading hatred. All right, it's champion time. I set up two calm minds against Pidgeot while he uses wing attacks, bringing us to around 60% health before taking it out. At plus two, we can now Oko Venusaur, Alakazam, Rhydon, Gyarados, and finally Arcanine. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. This was by far my fastest round one completion time to date. I find myself wondering if there's another Pokemon that could possibly beat this time? Groudon, perhaps? Kyogre clocks in with a round one time of 53 minutes and 11 seconds at level 56 with one reset. This took 3 hours and 22 minutes of game time. Alright Groudon, let's see what you can do. Notice how Groudon's experience bar is also completely empty as I use some rare candies before Victory Road to gain the full effect of our repels. I set up a single bulk up against Dugong while she changes the weather, then Earthquake drops her. Cloyster is out and I predict the shenanigans, bulking up once more. The exact same thing as Kyogre happens with spikes, so I set up again, and then take it out after some more protect nanigans. With that amount of setup, we now Oko Slowbro, Jinx, and Lapras. I'm so confident about this Bruno fight that I neither save nor heal before coming into it. I set up a sub turn 1 against Onyx, so we're about a quarter health. Our decoy easily tanks Onyx's moves while we set up a single bulk up and go for the sweep. Bruno can definitely be scary sometimes, but not for these two. Against Agatha, it's time to really rely on those substrats. Outspeeding her lead and setting up one immediately in the hopes of avoiding any hypnosis and confuse ray tactics she may try. She instead spams double teams, so when we finish our setup, we fortunately hit through quite quickly. At plus two, we then Oko her Golbat, almost her Ace Gengar, missing the damage range for the first time, and her Arbok in the back. Once again, leaning on prior knowledge, I make sure to use an elixir while healing before Lance. I set up three bulk ups, bringing us to plus two attack because of the intimidate before switching to the offense. Rock Slide gives us a super effective option against his three main threats, and we take down Aerodactyl, followed by his Ace Dragonite, and then because of its higher accuracy, I use Earthquake to clean up his Dragonairs. I'm taking no chances in this champion battle with that darn Executor, so from behind a sub I set all the way up to plus six while Pidgeot foolishly fires fruitless feather dances and sand attacks against our decoy. Alright, maybe I'm taking a small chance against Executor because I take out Blastoise immediately without allowing him to change the weather. This makes the coconut Pokemon faster than us, but once again, behind the safety of our decoy, we happily dodge Sleep Powder, taking it down. We then Oko Alakazam, Rhydon, and Arcanine for the win. I won't post any results until the end of the video because I don't want a break in the action. Groudon is about to post a fantastic time, and we still have the round 2 league to handle. I forget to stop the timer because I was way too into the run itself, but Groudon clocks in with a time of 54 minutes and 7 seconds at level 55 with zero resets. This took, wait, 5 hours and 5 minutes of game time? That doesn't make sense. Ah, I get it. It seems like that was my flub with Groudon. Before the round one league, nature called, so I had to stop the real timer, apparently without stopping the gameplay, or restarting when I came back. There's been a lot going on in life lately, and I've been starting to feel like I'm burning the candle at both ends. Fortunately, I feel that the game time is the least important metric that I track. I'd be commenting on the Lorelei battle, but after a visit to Seven Island for Swords Dance, we trounce her team. 
Because of our phenomenal physical defense and resistance to Rock Tomb, our decoy gives us all the time we need to set up a single SD and sweep his team. I should also mention that I used the remainder of the rare candies that I'd picked up throughout the run to add as much consistency to this league as I can. Although I am interested in how low of a level I can beat the game at, this contest is all about speed. Against Agatha, I forgot to heal between battles, so we're only at about 3 quarters health going in. Our decoy tanks a psychic and then prevents a hypnosis from landing, while we once again set up a single SD and take out our lead. Arbok and Crobat fall in quick succession, but then this battle takes a turn. Rockslide misses Mischievous, allowing it to hit a psychic, bringing us to 78 HP, around a third. Her Ace Gengar comes out, outspeeds, and crits, knocking us out. I guarantee you that crit mattered. In the next battle, it's the same story, this time not missing against Mischievous, bringing us to her Ace in green health. We then get an incredibly unfavorable range, with Gengar holding on by a sliver. I make a misplay here, but in the moment I didn't trust the range, going for SD before switching back to Rock Slide. Psychic is doing 65 damage, so yeah, that crit mattered last time. Fortunately, Gengar doesn't crit again, and we hang on in red bar, taking down Agatha. Alright, that was kind of intense, and Dragon Doctoral Lance is unquestionably a threat. I set up a sub, then Swords Dance while he also sets up with Dragon Dance and hits an Earthquake, breaking our decoy. Thankfully, he sets up one more time while I fire off Rock Slide, taking out Gyarados. Kingdra is out, and I try setting up once more, as because of Intimidate, we're only at plus one, and I need the Okos. Kingdra hits us with a devastating Ice Beam, bringing us down to about a third while we take it down with EQ. Thankfully, we don't miss once as we Oko his Ace Dragonite, Lesser Dragonite, and Aerodactyl. Part of me was expecting a Crit Hyper Beam at the end there. Whew. The Round 2 champion is all that stands between us and the Hall of Fame. Against his lead Heracross, I set up a sub, then Sword Stance while he breaks the decoy with Megahorn. Taking a quarter of our max is far less than what Megahorn can do to us, so I rinse and repeat, now at plus 4 attack. Rock Slide deletes Heracross. Blastoise is out and I play the weather game, setting up one final SD while he activates the rain. EQ gets the Oko. With our setup and behind a sub, I can now Oko Executor. Alakazam outspeeds and breaks the decoy while EQ breaks him, allowing us to finish off Tyranitar and Arcanine. Alright, admittedly that wasn't a perfect run, but that is going to be a high bar to beat. Most Pokémon that I run haven't even defeated the Round 1 League by this point. Groudon clocks in with a Round 2 time of 1 hour, 12 minutes, and 9 seconds at level 67 with 1 reset. This took 5 hours and 27 minutes of game time, which once we have Kyogre's results, I will, um, guesstimate where it should actually be. Alright Kyogre, the bar is set, let's see what you're capable of. Leading off against Dugong, I set up a single Calm Mind while it double teams. Because Thunder bypasses accuracy in the rain, we hit through getting the Oko. Thunder also Oko's Lapras, then Cloyster, then Piloswine, and Jinx both fall to our rain-boosted Surf. I don't bother saving before coming into Bruno, and this almost proved to be a nasty mistake. Steelix hits a Rock Tomb, lowering our speed by one stage while we set up a single Calm Mind, allowing Hitmonlee to outspeed and land a critical Mega Kick, bringing us from nearly full to only 38 HP, 17% of our max. Thankfully, Hitmonlee is his fastest team member, and we aren't outsped anymore as we Oko Hitmonchan, Machamp, and his second Steelix. Alright Agatha, please try not to be too rude. Without a Meowth army backing us up, I'm out of Chesto Berries, having used the only one on round 1 Agatha. I set up one Calm Mind while she puts us to sleep. Fortuitously, we wake up on the second turn after taking a Shadow Ball for not much damage, taking down her lead. We then Oko her Mischievous and Arbok. Her Ace Gengar is next, outspeeding and hitting Thunderbolt, but despite our weakness, we're still above half health. Crobat also outspeeds, hitting Sludge Bomb and taking us to around a quarter while we knock it out. Kyogre also used its remaining rare candies before this league, and I'm super happy that we did. Round 2 land shouldn't prove much of a problem for Kyogre, as we have a massive type advantage against most of his team. Gyarados falls to a 4 times super effective Thunder, and then both Dragonites fall to a 4 times super effective Ice Beam. I set up a single Calm Mind against Kingdra for the better ranges and deliver two massive Thunders, taking it down. Aerodactyl is last, outspeeding and hitting Earthquake, which we tank very well, washing it away with Surf. 
Based on our time right now, I feel like if we wipe against the champion, Kyogre loses. But if we defeat him on the first try, then Kyogre has this. My palms are sweaty. My knees weak. Arms heavy. There's vomit on my sweater already. It's mom spaghetti. I recognize the threat of Heracross, not to our health, but to our speed. I go immediately for Surf, bringing him into deep red bar while he misses Megahorn. I would have taken a Megahorn gladly, as long as it wasn't Rock Tomb. While he heals, I set up one Calm Mind and then Oko with Surf. Tyranitar shares that fate after shifting the weather out of our favor. Venusaur is next, also getting one shot by Ice Beam. Alakazam outspeeds, hitting Psychic, but we Oko again with Surf. Gyarados is out and I go for Thunder. We're no longer in the rain, please don't miss. We hit and it falls. Home stretch. Arcanine is last, hitting priority extreme speed, bringing us to 69 health. Nah, ah, ah, ice. While we Oko with Surf. What a glorious finish. Oh yeah, that feels good. I had so much fun playing all four of these runs. Who would have thought that blasting through this game with legendary Pokemon could be so great? Kyogre clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 10 minutes, and 24 seconds at level 66 with 1 reset. This took 4 hours and 27 minutes of game time. Excelente! Let's take a quick moment to review the Pokémon individually between playthroughs, then compare our final results. Kyogre started gaining time over the previous run immediately, even with the tiny bit of additional grinding in the early game. The only fluctuations in time we had was because of forgetting Erika in the mid-game, then running to grab Thunder before Blaine instead of before the League doors. Overall, we saved 6 minutes and 55 seconds of real time, 2 levels higher for the safety, with 8 less resets and 15 minutes less game time. Groudon started with a small time loss against Brock because of the sand attacks from Sand True, causing us to run back to the Poke Center for some power points. From there, we gained and maintained a time lead, adding the best strats, substrats, and clocking in a full 19 minutes and 24 seconds faster by the end, 6 levels lower with 14 less resets. My guesstimated game time also fell by about 30 minutes, which seemed fair. Groudon is the embodiment of what my Griffin Riders in Warcraft 3 used to say. It's not the size of the hammer that counts, it's how you wield it. Comparing these two legendary Pokémon, we can clearly see that this was a tight race. I would have loved to run these with newer mechanics such as the physical special split and updated learn sets that would have allowed Groudon to better utilize its physical prowess. With that said, Groudon put up a heck of a fight, gaining a lead twice throughout the run, but losing at the end by 1 minute and 45 seconds. The poll that I posted for your predictions on the outcome of this run is pretty one-sided, but I hope that I did the Groudon fans out there proud. Crowd. Thank you all for casting your votes. On the tier list, after seeing these performances, I have no choice but to bump everyone down on the list. These two are far and above the best runs to date, showcasing what an S tier performance should look like. The sprites are even so massive that two of them take up the same space as three normal Pokemon. I'm gonna have to rethink this graphic sometime soon. If you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. My channel has experienced some incredible growth lately, and I have to take a moment to appreciate each and every one of you for your support. I have been loving reading all of your comments with feedback, suggestions, strategy discussions, and unreal support. If you feel like I've earned it today, leave a like and comment about your thoughts, what you'd like to see next, and feedback. Or just say hi. Salutations! If you want to keep up with my content, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you never miss a video. As Groudon proved today, Substrats Best Strats. I am so excited to continue bringing more content to you and watching this community grow. To all of you out there, you are all exceptional in my books. Until next time, take care everyone.